Oh, hi. Just over here, uh, spinning my empty Starbucks cup, you know, for no reason. It's definitely empty. There's definitely no liquids in here. Or is there? So by some strange magic, and you guys, I'm sure, have seen this trick before, this water managed to stay in this cup even though I was spinning it in a circle and it was upside down for a certain amount of time, okay? Um, and this magic, I think, is the perfect introduction to this topic of circular motion, um, which is this week's focus. Um, if you guys could turn to the slides, um, I want to kick it off with the quote of the week, um, which is from a, a Buddhist meditation teacher named John Kabat-Zinn. Um, and this quote is, wherever you go, there you are. And that might sound preposterously obvious, and probably very boring, but I think uh, this is an important quote for, for thinking about how we approach our challenges, um, especially the challenges that result from, you know, habits that we have. Um, a lot of times we think that we can outrun ourselves if we go to a different location or find a different job, um, but the truth of the matter is, even in that new location, we're still there and we still have the same minds and we still have the same history and we still have the same habits. So usually it takes a little bit something deeper um, looking inside uh, and you know doing, doing the work to change bad habits as opposed to just changing the, the details or the circumstances of your life. Okay, um, So I was moved by that quote and from there we will go to why do we care, right? Um, and it turns out that circular motion is one of the leading ways, in fact, almost definitely the method we will use to reproduce gravity in space during long-term missions. For example, a mission to Mars, if we were to go to one. And maybe you guys, if you've ever seen the movie The Martian, you've actually seen this, where the, the little space vehicle that they're taking over there to Mars is rotating like this. And that is because when you create that rotation, you're creating something called a centripetal acceleration. And if you're rotating at just the right speed, so that centripetal acceleration is 9.8 meters per second squared, then you, my friends, have gravity. And that's how we'd fake gravity in space, so that it feels like we trick our bodies into thinking that um, you know, we're, we're still under Earth gravity. Okay? And most of the biological um, processes that happen in the body because of that gravity um, continue operating in a similar way. And by the end of this lesson, you will be able to calculate how fast that space thing will have to rotate so that you exactly mimic Earth gravity, um, which I think is very cool. So if you guys could advance to the next slide, um, this introduces us to um, so what are the basic rules of circular motion? And this chapter focuses on a particular kind of circular motion, which is called uniform circular motion. And uniform circular motion just means that you're moving in a perfect circle, A, and B, the speed at which you're moving in that circle never ever changes. Okay? So we're talking about a perfect circle, right? And the speed is equal to a constant. Okay? Never changes, all right, as it rotates. All right, so there's no accelerating radially like that, okay? Um, and so when you have an object, I don't know, let's just say that this is the Earth and this is the Moon, just for funsies, okay? So whenever you have an object undergoing uniform circular motion, um, there's a couple things that are always important to remember. One of those things is that the velocity vector of that object is always perfectly tangent to the circle, right? So V is always going to be tangent to the circle, no matter where you are, okay? So that's the first thing. At any given instant, the velocity vector of the object is tangent to the circle, obviously in the direction that you're going. So your velocity here is just there, your velocity here is just there, um, and then the centripetal acceleration vector, right? The, remember I said that anything moving in a circle actually has an acceleration, right? And that guy, the acceleration vector, is always going to be pointing inwards. So acceleration vectors in, acceleration vectors in, 
centripetal acceleration vector is n, n, right? So velocity points tangent, acceleration vector points n. And I know what you're thinking, okay? You're thinking, wait a second here. If speed is constant, if this is uniform circular motion, okay, then why would it be that I have any kind of acceleration, okay? And you'd be right. You're on the right track here, but you're forgetting one thing. And that is that, remember, acceleration is a change in velocity, not just speed. And velocity is speed plus direction. So if your direction's changing, right, you're, it requires a force to do that, okay? And so that change in velocity and just the direction of velocity, even though the, the magnitude of the velocity stays the same, the change in direction has to be due to an acceleration, and that acceleration you call centripetal acceleration. Okay, so once again, even though the speed is the same, the direction is changing, and that means velocity is changing, and if velocity is changing, you definitely have an acceleration. Okay, all right, so this is one thing you should always know about circular motion in terms of its vectors, okay? Now, this leads us to a misconception question because this is very interesting. Uh, so imagine a planet is orbiting a star. Let's suppose that you have the ability to snap your fingers and magically make the star disappear, okay? In this case, imagine you can snap your fingers and magically make the Earth disappear, um, thereby instantly removing the gravitational force keeping the planet moving in a circle, okay? What path will the planet take after the star disappears. Okay, so there's a, there's a couple options, right? You know, someone maybe will guess that, okay, so if I have my, my little planet over here, right, and it's orbiting this way, some might guess that it'll shoot out like this, right? Some might guess that it'll go in a curved path like that, right? Some might guess that, you know, because there's gravitational attraction, it'll go like that, okay? Some might guess that it would go straight tangent to the circle right there, okay? What path would it follow? Which of those guys? So, in our problem here, the options are, A, a straight line perpendicular to the circle, right? That's, that's this guy, right? Straight line perpendicular out. A straight line parallel to the circle, that's this guy here. C, a curved line bending in the same direction as a circle. So that would be this, right? And T, the planet will just be still. If I take away the, the sun, or in this case, the Earth, right? Whatever is gravitationally keeping that in a circle, if I take it away, will it just stop moving completely because the, the gravitational source is gone? Um, so here's the thing. All you need to do is apply Newton's first law, right? And so if you take away the object, you've taken away the force of gravity, okay? And if you take away the force of gravity, then there's no force acting on that object anymore, right? So that means that whatever motion it had when the force was taken away, that motion must remain the same, just like Newton's first law says, right? So, so at this precise moment, the star, or sorry, the planet will be moving in a straight line, right, tangent to the circle, tangent to the orbit, right? If so if you take away the star, there's no more forces, that object's motion must remain in that motion unless acted on by some other force, right? So in that case, the answer will be B, okay? It's gonna continue in a straight line parallel to the circle because that's what the velocity vector was at that point originally, right? And if the force is gone, there's no more force acting on it. Okay, I hope that's clear. Uh, if not, reach out to me. So that begs the question, okay, if there is some centripetal acceleration, you guys can advance to the slide that says centripetal acceleration, if there's some centripetal acceleration that always exists, keeping this thing into a circle, right, allowing that velocity to continue to change as it moves, the object moves around the circle, right, the question remains, how do I calculate it? What is the magnitude of that acceleration that's constantly changing that velocity, right? And it turns out, that acceleration is simply A equals the velocity squared, the, the magnitude of the velocity that you're moving in a circle, divided by the radius of that circle. Okay? So, and actually I don't even have to put this little arrow here, right? Because this is just the magnitude. So the magnitude, how big that acceleration is, is just equal to the velocity, the speed squared, divided by the radius of that circle. 
All right? So increase the velocity, you must increase the centripetal acceleration. Increase the radius, right? Make it a bigger circle, and you're actually decreasing the centripetal acceleration. But if you make that radius really small, it's a tight circle, right? That acceleration has to be even larger, which makes sense intuitively, okay? Um, so how do we apply this, right? Well, let's go ahead and use a biomedical application. The centrifuge, right? The centrifuge is our primary tool that we use to separate different components of blood, specifically the plasma and the actual blood cells, okay? Um, and you guys maybe have seen these before. It's really cool. They spin at like tremendous velocities and they use this, they, they, they harness this power of centripetal acceleration to actually separate the cells from the plasma, okay? So, in medical labs, blood centrifuges use used uniform circular motion to separate the platelets and red blood cells from the blood plasma. An ultra centrifuge will spin at a rate of 35,000 RPM, which means revolutions per minute. What is this speed in meters per second, assuming a centrifuge with a 20 centimeter radius, okay? So we want speed first. Right now, we, we have a rate, okay, we know it, that it's 35,000 revolutions per minute. But what we don't know is, what we don't know is what is its actual speed, right? We want to find V for that centrifuge, okay? How fast is it actually spinning? And we need that in meters per second, not revolutions per minute. That's silly, right? So how would I do that? Well, guys, we use the same old rule that we've been doing, right? Okay, but he, so here's the thing. Here's the thing. So we're going to do the, the classic ladder method here. But revolutions, right? One revolution is one full trip around the outside of that, of that circle, right? So one revolution, right, is 2 pi r meters, right? Because 2 pi r is the circumference of a circle. So one revolution is 2 pi r meters, and now we can cancel out revolutions, okay? And we, want, we don't want minutes. We don't want revolutions per minute. We want meters per second. And so we know that there is, in one minute, there is 60 seconds, okay? So that gives us everything we want. We know that the radius of this centrifuge here is 20 centimeters. So we're talking, we're going to put in 0.2 meters in there, right? And then when I put that in my calculator, and you guys can confirm, I get the value of 732.67 meters per second, all right? Uh, and that's a velocity, okay? So my units are right. I should have meters per second. So that's actually how fast a point on the outside of that centrifuge is actually uh, moving, right? Okay, second question. At this speed, what is the centripetal acceleration experienced by the sample, okay? All right, so let's do that. Remember, centripetal acceleration is just A equals V squared over R. We just found the velocity is 732.67. We square that, divide by the radius of the centrifuge, which is, again, 0 0.2 meters. Okay, and I get a value of, quite a, quite a hefty value, 2,680,000. Five hundred and sixty meters per second squared. Okay, you might be asking, should it be that high? And the answer is yes. Right, that's the whole point. That's we are harnessing centripetal acceleration at huge magnitudes to actually separate these. And by the end of this problem, you'll see why the platelets, the blood cells, and the plasma will actually separate. Okay, all right. So third, it says use the famous equation. Uh, F, equals MI, F equals MA to determine the force on each individual blood cell during the spin, okay? Um, so the force in each individual blood cell, we have F equals MA, right? I have done the heavy lifting on this one and found out that the weight of one blood cell uh, is about 27 times 10 to the minus 15 kilograms, right? So I have 27 times 10 to the minus 15 kilograms, and that's multiplied by the acceleration, which is this guy. I'm just going to put that right there, right? 
So that I'm experiencing a force, a centripetal force, in this case, of 7.2 times 10 to the minus 8 newtons. Okay? And this explains why these particles actually separate, right? Because plasma is primarily water, right? The, the major component of, of blood plasma is water, right? Um, and, but the major component of, of red blood cells is, well, I mean, they're much bigger than H2 O molecule, right? I mean, the cells have the, a, a lot of complex proteins and, you know, apparatuses that make it weigh a lot more, right? So the very fact that the mass of the red blood cell is so much higher than the mass of a water molecule means that this force is going to be much, much larger on the blood cells, right? Allowing them to be, to, to be thrusted to the bottom of the tube, which is the, the outside of the tube, when you're spinning, okay? So more massive blood cells means um, more centripetal force experienced on the blood cells, meaning that separation is going to be more marked, all right? Um, and so very last question here is that what would be the period of a one full rotation? And I threw this question in here before because just period is something that's going to come up in physics again and again, and I want you guys to have the opportunity to practice it. So period just means the amount of time required for one full revolution, right? And so usually it has a symbol T, right? And we can just use the very, very classic formula that T is equal to distance divided by velocity, right? Remember, velocity is equal to distance divided by time. So I could just flip these guys. T is going to be distance divided by velocity. Remember, the distance of one full revolution is just 2 pi r, right? Um, where r is 0.2 meters. And the velocity, we calculate over here, is 732.67. If I put all that in with my r being 0.2, I get a value of 0.0. 017 seconds. Okay? All right. So, in other words, each revolution, that's the period, each revolution takes 0 0.0017 seconds, a very preposterously small amount of time. Okay? So, the major learning lesson that I want you to take from here, A, is a little bit of practice on how to solve for acceleration. Okay? And secondly, um, centripetal acceleration specifically. And secondly, how can I convert that centripetal acceleration into an actual force that's felt by the particle or the object, right? And then also realizing that because the mass of a blood cell is so much more than the mass of a water molecule, that will create a larger force which would thrust all those uh, blood cells to the outside of the circle, right? which is the bottom of the centrifuge tube, which, you, as you can see in this picture, that's where the blood cells end up congregating. Okay?